Welcome everyone. Today I wanted to share my journey of remembering. It's been just over a year now. My first memories come through late, late February last year. And wow, what a year. I wanted to wanted to share to assist survivors because I know there are so many that are starting to remember at this time and and move through that process and and just really break down the first memories that come through for me, um, the experience of those and how it really is possible to heal and integrate and move through you know each and every memory, building ourselves up and really becoming, becoming more of who we truly were before the original abuse and trauma. For me personally, I've chosen to heal outside of the traditional systems of support that we look at in our communities. So things like psychologists, therapists, talk therapy, just because I was already being targeted both for what I do in terms of speaking out publicly for survivors and and victims of crimes against children. And also at that stage, so from 2019, I was being targeted by a whole family who yeah, weren't too happy about me, me realizing who they were and, and breaking us out of that situation. So yeah, I've I've spent a lot of time with other survivors, which I find incredibly healing, hearing their stories and being able to work through that together. But I really wanted to to show how how much healing is possible just through you processing your memories yourself, you holding space for yourself. And, you know, it, give, it gives me so much hope for the future, so much hope for, you know, survivors in that, you know, it, this doesn't have to be a life sentence. This is something we can move through. This is something that we can heal through. So for me, I already knew I was a survivor of child sexual abuse. I'd been abused by a family friend when I was the ages of 12 and 13. And interestingly, this quite often is repeated in survivor stories as uh, always remembered abuse, always remembered um, trauma that really becomes a mask for deeper lying traumas. So for me, knowing that I did go through that rape, that manipulation, that that grooming and targeting as a as a teenager it served to really protect the older abuse because any time I felt emotions coming up I was struggling emotionally struggling physically you know feeling triggered having bad dreams etc everything would go back and be attributed to this rape that I knew and I know that's a very common scenario for many survivors um, so I hope that that gives us some tools to unpack, you know, watch the strategies of the cults in terms of leaving a abuse memory to kind of become a marker, a marker memory for everything else that is being triggered underneath. So literally in the last year, my entire life has been turned upside down and I already knew about ritual abuse. I knew about the satanic control of the world. I'd escaped from a cult, a very high and powerful cult in Victoria that's active. Uh, they are part of the Shriners, very versed in things like psychic attack. They train their children as theatre assassins, so really moving into um, targeting others through the astral and through psychic means. So, you know, I, I was pretty aware of a lot of things that were going on in the world, and yet when my own memories started to come through, broke, broke through in February, it literally just changed everything for me. Incredibly shocking, but it also explained so much of my life that I'd always had questions about. Thankfully, I've had an incredibly strong intuition my whole life, and it had really been guiding me with a lot of feedback about different family members, about Know, what was really going on around me and yeah it really made me realize that I've known at least in part my whole life but it go just goes to show the strength of the mind control programming and you know how much we'd rather 
not face those kind of things as well. So now I have memories coming through most weeks, sometimes a couple, sometimes there'll be a week off. And it's just been a question of when I've integrated these memories enough and healed enough through them to be able to share as someone that's already speaking out publicly and supporting other survivors. So the memories that I'm sharing today are really from the first six months. They've had a lot of other memories that have come through around them to really fill them in because it's kind of like a bit of a jigsaw puzzle just being thrown out on the table piece by piece. You know, one of the hardest things is just trying to work out the chronological order of memories because there's not there's not a time and date stamp, unfortunately, like there would be for a video or a photo and you've got to judge off different things. It might be what you're wearing, who's around you, any other markers or key points that you can kind of tie it in with. So I mean, these are the memories that I'm really confident with that I've been able to integrate into other parts of my known memories that I've always had um, and have you know, thoroughly went through and researched and went back through my family history, finding what I can to really, I guess, allow me to move through both the shock and the denial before being able to present these in order to help other survivors heal. So I wanted to cover a bit about what is it actually like remembering and for people to actually you know, have the keys to distinguish between what might be something that's been programmed into you and a real memory. Because we know that, you know, there's programming attempts happening through therapy, all sorts of avenues, institutions, a lot of videos being weaponized with different frequencies. And you know, we have to be really careful in these times. So a real memory when it comes through is like finding something that you've misplaced for a very long time. And I'd liken that to being a woman when I used to, to like shopping and doing all that. Sometimes I'd buy something and just chuck it in the closet. And I would have absolutely no recollection of that particular item that I bought and put away until I actually come across it. And then when I touched it, looked at it, felt it, held it, I'd be able to tell you when I bought it, what I was doing, who I was with that day, how long it was ago. But until I actually saw that memory, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that was a part of my life. So, you know, that's a, a bit of a distinguishing feature with a real memory. You'll know that it is a memory that's coming through because you can recall actually having thought it at some time as well. Um, I always try once when memories come through as part of my integration process to connect it to other memories and this, they will connect to obviously consciously remembered things as well. So sometimes when a memory comes through, it will actually trigger a whole lot of other memories that weren't suppressed behind amnesi amnesiac walls for me to come through just because it was of a time and a place that maybe I hadn't thought about in a very, very long time. So that's two key things for survivors to help you move through both the shock and the denial is, you know, can you, can you actually place that memory now that it's come back? Can you actually recall that it was your memory at some stage in a very, very long, long time ago part of your life? And secondly, can you actually connect it to other memories, particularly those that weren't perhaps buried behind amnesiac walls, but as you move along further in the remembering process, there'll be other memories that come through that connect as well. So there's a lot of statements out there at the moment that survivors shouldn't listen to other stories or they don't want to read certain things because they feel it will compromise their own memories. I have tried and tested that. Um, on myself I'm a bit of a unless I can ground it and see it in my life it's not real to me and I think in these times of so many psyops and so much deceit we really have to be careful that anything be, is able to be grounded into our reality so my observations on that are it, I don't believe it's true in any sense I've actually seen survivors be able to work through their own memories both ones they haven't had and memories, memories that are triggered by listening to other survivors in a far more effective way because they know that it's happened to someone else 
and it won't ever be exactly the same. So, you know, there's there's no way that I'd go around saying, oh, that person's story is just like mine. It may have similar themes. And even if you were a survivor and you're in exactly the same ritual as another survivor, you're both going to have had a different experience of that. And as different people, you're going to recall different parts of that experience that would have meant different things to you. So I actually believe that survivors speaking out and sharing their stories is creating the space for other survivors to heal, for people that are have not remembered what we'd call sleepers out in society are slowly being shook awake because you know these topics are being covered and people are starting to remember their own abuse whether it's the same or perhaps it's just a similar theme perhaps it's you know a scaled down version of something else that's happened to someone else but by these things being discussed it is discussed publicly it's actually greatly speeding up the, the process of healing and particularly survivors getting through that shock and denial stage and onto onto healing and it is incredibly healing to know that we're not alone it gives me gives me so much hope and inspiration every single survivor and whistleblower that I bring on to to this platform to share their stories because you know within each of those stories is you know their amazing healing story their story of triumph of how they overcome you know this horrific trauma which should have never happened and through healing they're now in a position to start speaking out for other survivors and you know that just warms my heart that's what this is all about and that is us pushing back on satan's kingdom and shutting it down one mind at a time it kind of this whole this whole these whole statements of survivors shouldn't listen to other stories or it will compromise their own memories it just it just reminds me so much of the false memory psyop which is used to discredit to survivors and suggest that you know their memories because they're coming through 10 or 20 or 30 or like me 40 years later uh, you know, actually not true because why didn't they have them? And we know that's completely incorrect. We know that the mind, when it's under that kind of abuse and trauma, will split itself and suppress these memories just to protect. It's a survival mechanism. And, you know, the the false memory, memory psyop was set up by a couple that were abusing their own daughter, intelligence agencies. It's, it's thick. It's thick with deceit. So I think, you know, we have to be very careful that we're testing things and if there's survivors listening to this that are you know maybe not reading certain things or not wanting to watch other stories because they feel they might be triggered or it might affect their memories I don't believe that it is going to affect your memories it may encourage your mind to begin unlocking earlier but it would only do that if if it was time for you, time for you to heal when you were strong enough as well. So obviously don't go out and completely trigger yourself and you know watch watch too much. I think we have to always be completely in balance and supporting ourselves. But I just wanted to to cover that because that's a question that's asked a lot of me with new survivors remembering. And I think it's important that you know we support new survivors as they are remembering and work, working through breaking this horrific mind control to heal. Yeah, so listening to other stories will actually assist breaking through your own amnesiac barriers uh, by, by hearing these similar themes. It will often encourage you to remember things that you've forgotten, and that's both from your conscious memory. So it could be like, wow, that's so similar to something that happened to me as a child that you remember or it could slowly start unlocking a completely dissociated trauma as well. And either way, the only way to healing is straight through. We've got to face those fears and find the underlying trauma so we can finally release them from our minds, our bodies, our souls and our spirits. One thing I think we have to be really careful of at this time is survivors often unknowingly are being used and their stories are being used towards different agendas political agendas there's agendas in the new age that they're being used towards and various intelligence psyops out there um, and our truths are so important at this time you know our truths of our lived experience is so important and the unfortunate thing is when survivor stories start being pulled into these various agendas that 
have nefarious roots have been, and are being led nefariously. Our stories are being used out in the public to further things like saviour programming. I mean, we can see this around the White Hats, different political parties, the US Army coming to save people, and now we've got the galactic saviours. So I think as survivors, it's really important that we choose our words carefully and you know, ensure to the best of our ability that we don't get sucked in and become part of pushing narratives that are not not of goodness and they're not about healing and you know they may, they may put out that love and light that they're all all here to help but at, at the end of the day we know a lot of these agendas particularly through the political realm and the military are not of goodness and they're actually agendas of control. I feel like survivors really need to be careful and speak on what they've personally experienced. And this goes back to not being dragged into other agendas because I mean, there's always areas that are being sensationalised at any given time. At present have, you know, new age intelligence ops really obsessed with pushing this reptilian and alien narrative and unfortunately, that's dragging a lot of unsuspecting survivors in, into these agendas, as well as a lot of people that are just starting wait, to wake up to what is satanic ritual abuse. And it, it really is leading away from real solutions and the real truth of survivors being empowered and just being able to heal through the various MK programs, which, as Fritz Springmeier, you know, wrote about extensively and other programmers have a lot of alien themes. So my first memory broke through in February last year. It it was a first that I consciously grasped what it was. However, looking back, I can now see throughout my life there were so many times that different memories and different recollections were trying to break through and I just completely pushed those down. And I think that is a very common thing when I speak to survivors that are just starting to, to remember is it has often taken years for, you know, what we would consider the first memories to come through. And in 2016, I had went through a complete career burnout and yeah, lost, lost pretty much everything. I lost, lost my job because of my health. I lost my house, my car, the whole lot. I was I was unable to get diagnosed for 18 months, just under two years, um, just trying to work through every therapy, every test, just trying to work out what was actually going on. Different organs were failing, different systems in my body was failing. And, you know, when I look back now, it really was what we would call my front parts, the parts that, you know, would interact with work, with people, with my career, were just so tired. They were so tired of holding up this facade and, and you know, keeping this this show of I'm, I'm successful, I'm doing well. And, you know, I had an amazing career, travelled all over the world, was training 20 to 30 staff at a time, running multiple businesses in travel and, it was incredible, but it was so tiring. And underneath all that busyness that I was so addicted to, there was obviously so much that I hadn't dealt with from earlier in my life. So when from those front parts breaking down and literally changing my whole life in 2016, it was literally another five years before I would actually be in touch with the memories. It's all a process of unraveling unfolding and kind of like peeling back the, the layers of the onion to find the deeper parts of of who we are so my first memory come through is what I would call like a waking dream when your subconscious mind is more in touch with your conscious mind just because you haven't really put on haven't completely woken up haven't sort of come back into that full full mindset of who you are day to day and Earlier in life, I never used to dream much at all. And it's only been over the last five years that, you know, I've had dreams that weren't nightmares. And that's a very common thing with survivors is we don't dream. And that really shows that split, that break between the subconscious and the conscious mind. And I'm, I'm sure that we do dream quite often, but we just are unable to remember it. And the only ones that I ever used to seem to be able to remember were the nightmares. And that would be because 
they would wake me up. And as I was waking up um, on this morning in February last year, a nightmare that had literally plagued my whole childhood, my teens, my 20s, and had interestingly stopped late in my 20s when my grandmother, who turns out to be one of my perpetrators, passed away. And it was it was such a terrifying dream for me. I've I've lived through this dream hundreds, if not thousands of times. And I would wake up screaming with absolutely no sound coming out, struggling to wake up, just you know, shaking and trying to throw myself around in bed until I woke up, sweating, completely unable to sleep, often paralyzed and nonverbal. So the dream that was opening up for me that morning was the dream that had literally plagued me my whole my whole life before but I hadn't had for decades now and it was of being at my grandmother's house which is an old bungalow in regional South Australia on the York Peninsula and in her house in the lounge room is where I'd always find myself in this dream I'd be alone and the floors would give away, there'd just be fire and you could see down forever and they'd literally be looking like looking down into hell and there'd be revolting sounds of demonics and, and things screaming down there coming up. And the only way, because the floor would just completely give away to the point where I would have almost nothing to stand on, just a, a floorboard would be left, would be the only way for me to actually leave from this room would be to grab a rope that just happened to be swinging there to swing over the fire to the other side of the lounge room, which was quite a big room, past the cuckoo clock that would often go off as I was swinging past and just felt completely evil. And once I would make it across, drop off the rope, an angel would be there and it would be Archangel Michael who's constantly been around me and supporting me and saving me at various times in my life and he would tell me to climb down into the earth that there was a tunnel there and I could go through it and find a place of safety and I was to wait there until things were okay so uh, in this dream I would literally find a tunnel that would go straight down into into the earth it would be really tight I'd have to really squeeze through and it would feel quite constricting and I'd get to the other side and it would be a beautiful oasis there'd be a little water hole often Jesus would come and sit with me there and speak to me and give me different guidance and I would just play there there'd be frogs and while I was there there would be just shaking so at times there would be would be like the whole sky would shake the whole the whole place would just shudder and I would be like what is going on what what is going on out there and you know Jesus or if it was Michael that was there with me would just say just wait until it's quiet and then they would tell me when I could go back so that was essentially the dream uh that I would wake up from screaming and the more this morning that it started to literally open up I had the same feelings of terror of being trapped and, you know, because my mind was just starting to wake up as I was waking up in the morning, I was thinking, oh, my God, this is happening again. This hasn't come to me in decades. And again, hadn't recalled the dream in such a long time either. But this time the dream opened up with all the same themes, but it was a very, very different arrangement. And I was actually in my grandmother's laundry. I was hanging. So the rope was actually lassoed around under my arms and hung up from from a spot on the ceiling near, near the light in front of me was a priest which I I can only recognize because he was in a a dark robe he had a cross around his neck the priest priestly collar there was my grandmother and there was one of my aunties standing in front of me the feeling that I had just as I was coming into that visual or that uh that memory was just of being completely strangled just being completely unable to breathe in my dream and everything just went dark before this this memory actually opened up the next thing I saw was I moved from looking at my grandma the priest and my auntie who were in front of me just all facing me so I'd moved off to the right of my body and I was actually just 
looking at myself, looking at my lifeless body in a white dress. It's a white dress that I knew well. It had little red and blue stripes on there and an anchor. I used to call it my sailor boy dress and just looking around the room and there was, rather than being the fires of hell, there was some candles around the room. It was really dark. It was night time. And all of those same all of those same themes that were in my dream were there, but they were in a different organisation. And then I looked down after looking at my body and just, just being shocked by seeing myself lifeless like that. And underneath me was a wooden box, like a chest, and the tops had been opened. And the feeling of just pure demonic possession was coming up from that box and I could see down into it and there was just some bones and my feeling is it was like a relic uh it could have been a past relative or you know someone passed in the cult etc that they were using to call that horrific demonic energy into the room and I know talking about some of these things can be a bit confronting for people if they haven't experienced them themselves. But I point that, you know, we're in a spiritual war. We are fighting these archons and these demons that have been around for all of time. This is how the cults do it is they use different items to attach to those demonics and pull them in. And with the bones, with the bones being there, it was like they were, they were actually at this stage seeking to put that demonic energy into me. Once I was possessed by the energies of the demonic force that they wanted to put into me, the rapes would proceed. So the rapes would proceed with me on the rope. Sometimes I'd be taken off and it would be by the priest. And it was his way of interacting with and really seeking that power from the demon. The demonic force coming over me was such a horrific feeling on its own and then going through the pain of in violent rapes after that had happened and the priest would be calling out often speaking in words that I couldn't even understand and I don't know if that was just because of the trauma and potentially whatever drugs that I was on that I couldn't understand it being English but I actually think it was more just different commands and different ways that he was act interacting with the energy that he was using within me so that was literally one morning that I woke up in February that all dropped through and that day that it happened I was completely unable to speak I was non-verbal I was shaking I had waves of nausea just coming over me I felt like I was going to vomit I felt like my whole guts was going to drop out I just I didn't know what to do I couldn't move I was just trembling all I could think is I just need to write this down not that I th not that I thought I would forget it because it just it was just like it was on replay and replay for hours. Um, so I managed to write down what I saw and that seemed to calm my mind enough for it to to stop with the replay. And then hours later, I was finally able to speak to my partner because before that, I just couldn't get the words out. And I just I was just trembling, telling him what I'd recalled and you know, from the other things that we talked about from the other dreams and other things that had started coming up for me over the previous years, we were just like, it, it's all, it's all just finally breaking through. And I think that's the thing is when these memories come through, once you can get through the shock, it all starts to make sense. It starts to highlight things that were just hidden and bring forward bring forward the things that we've always been searching for and just couldn't quite get our minds around at the time. So over the next week from when this memory come through, it just started to settle into my conscious mind. That's a process that can often take months from a memory coming through as well. And the thing that I just couldn't stop thinking was, oh my God, my family is a cold. And I just, knowing what I know, knowing the people I speak to with, in terms of survivors, the research I've done. I just couldn't believe that I had not seen this before. And it was just so blatantly obvious as this memory started to connect through to all of the other memories and all of the things that had happened to me earlier in my life that I remembered, that were consciously remembered. It started to explain so much of what I, I thought 
and it, I had parked and I had put behind me is just a completely dysfunctional family as something a lot more, a lot more evil than I could ever imagine. And it really shows the strength of mind control, but it also shows how quickly we can break down mind control programming if we hold space for ourselves and find that healing within each memory. So to give you a bit of a background on my family, my mum's side, so my grandmother that I'm talking about is German and she's married to my grandpa, who's from the UK, both have thankfully passed. To describe what this family was like, they were you know, big German people. They were blonde with blue or green eyes. They're absolutely nothing like me being, you know, looking like of Asian of descent. And people used to actually think I was adopted, which I didn't mind because these people were pretty far out. And they lived in regional SA on the York Peninsula. The town is Port Broughton and it's an old farming and sheep area, like many areas in SA, with a heavy German influence around that time and or around that area. And it literally has, I think, just over a thousand people when I looked at the population, I, I would suggest it was probably even less when this this event occurred. To just think that, you know, a satanic cult was operating in a little town, a little blink of an eye town with a thousand people just really goes to show how much these cults own the whole of Australia and how this evil is literally under our noses in every community, every suburb, every town. In that area, I was literally one of the first Asian children that most people had seen and encountered a lot of racism. It was a very white, white area. It wasn't just the area that was racist. My family was incredibly racist. It was horrific. To give you an idea, they had a black dog, like a black retriever, they called him nigger. They're incredibly rough on him, like their children. And, you know, grandpa would do things like put petrol on him for fleas and yell at people not to go go near him with your cigarette or you'll set the bastard on fire. And yeah, interestingly, that would end up being fear programming for me later on and link into that. But, you know, after this memory come through, I realised I really needed to look into this side of the family and track down what was going on there. So I did the usual jump onto Ancestry.com. So as I researched my family history, which I'd never done before, I noticed that they had a lot of influence, which I had no idea of as a child growing up in that family. And when they'd come into Australia in the early, early days, they had went into Angus Angus Town in the Barossa, which is again a very cult operated area. It's um part of the winery region, and my family were married into some powerful wine families in the Barossa. They then moved to Peterborough, which was originally Pittsburgh and renamed after the war, well after World War II, to hide the German influence in that town because people were really uncomfortable with it. And Peterborough, where my grandmother's mother grew up and where the family still had a lot of connections. They were very linked into the state care system, into the mental health there. There was a links into these places. There's a lot of the family working as nurses. And this is all a stone's throw from, from Moonta. So I remember I used to play netball there as a child and Moonta's had its share of child murders. The next town over is Utina, which is infamously known for the ice cream truck that's been on the streets so that's been linked to child murders and networks. And then we have, you know, in Peterborough itself, places like the Peterborough Mansion, where you know, powerful people are flying in in small planes to abuse children every weekend. So it's an incredibly seedy part of the world where there is a lot of trafficking and again it just the thought had not crossed my mind to even go back into my family history until this memory had come up so as I took my bloodline back further I could see that they had actually come from Germany the German side and it was from a little town just outside of the Black Forest as soon as I had found my family's links to the Black Forest I just had waves of nausea I remembered on a work trip through my travel career, I'd actually visited this area in the Black Forest. And while I was there, there was a cuckoo shop 
And I'd went in, as you do, to do the sightseeing and see the cookie cookie shops with a group. And there were literally hundreds of cookie clocks going off at the same time. And I'd become so triggered. I felt so sick. I'd actually had to run outside and threw up. My head was spinning. I didn't have a, had the words for it at that time, but all of those cuckoo clocks, going back to the cuckoo clock that was at my grandmother's house, had completely dissociated me and put me into shock. And that cuckoo clock that was in my grandmother's lounge room that I would often see my dream and swing past and it would be cooling out would actually turn up in the memories that I was starting to recall. It was often the only signal or the only way that I was able to know that any time was passing when I was either locked up or still hanging or you know being tortured in various ways with just this cuckoo clock ringing out across the property so that was yeah that was a, a shock to see them go all the way back to Germany so my next question in terms of you know uncovering my memories was just why was I actually at my grandmother's on my own without my parents I'd been figuring I was a about four, about five, because I was little when I was looking at my body. And as I went back through my memories, trying to remember when I had that dress, I think I only had it when I was about four, five, six. So it had to be around those kind of dates. So digging through photos, asking questions, I actually found that I'd been sent to my grandmother's house for three weeks while my parents, my mother and father had taken a holiday and that was something I completely not recalled in any sense. And it, I would have been four years at the time based off of what I found. And that fitted exactly with what I seen. So these are all ways that I was able to ground the memory. And that's something I'm really careful to do is just, can I actually ground the memory into my life, into other memories, into evidence, into photos? You know, as a researcher, I know that experiences can be a lot of things and sometimes an experience can be be way off and it may not be highlighted that it's way off until other things come through so it's been important to me to just work through these find all the bits and pieces find the other parts of my past that link to the these memories that have come through and really support them so I know that I'm speaking the highest form of truth as well a lot of other memories started to come through that weren't behind amnesiac walls and they were things that I'd actually thought of as a child that I was now able to recall because of this memory of, of being tortured and abused at my grandmother's house had arrived and I started to remember the car trip which I'd always had access to but again just hadn't thought of for a very long time and that was a car trip going up to my grandmother's house with my parents. So I remember getting to my grandmother's house and it was late. It was after dark. And um, my parents were dropping me off. We were having dinner with my grandparents and the, the brothers and sisters that still lived there. And I remember feeling really dizzy, really out of it. And I just remember like sitting back on my chair, rocking and just literally feeling like I was going to melt. I felt isolated I felt completely split off from reality. I noticed that everyone else was talking and eating and I literally just felt like I was melting into my chair. And when I was looking at, at the light shade that of the light that was above the kitchen table that we were all sitting around directly above us, I could just see huge spiders, two huge spiders, like hand-sized, running around over that lampshade and I just could not take my eyes off them. I, I couldn't even say that I was scared, but I was shocked that these huge spiders were running around on this, this lampshade and no one could see it. And I was in a state that I actually couldn't even speak. So I was then put to bed. My parents left. And I believe that night is the night that I was taken to the laundry. Um, and part of that incident unraveled. So Everyone was thinking I was just tired from the road trip, which was several hours. I was feeling completely woozy, just off my head. And I would point to that I was drugged that night. The next memory that I've had come through was being woken up, being walked out through the dark, through my grandmother's garden. And just with a torch because there was no outside lights at that stage and being walked towards the laundry. And I remember just being so scared, so scared out at night, just with torches and being told that I was going to be taken to the toilet and I didn't need to go. 
and then that memory faded. And that's the thing with memories, they don't necessarily completely join. Um, hopefully, eventually, all of the in-betweens will come through. But to the best of my knowledge, you know, I was walked out to that laundry that night. I know that's that night because of what I was wearing, my pyjamas that I was being walked out in. Uh, and I can only only guess that you know what transpired in the laundry afterwards was that same night that I arrived. So they really, the cult didn't waste a moment to get started in terms of programming me, abusing me and starting to split my mind when I was dropped off by my parents. So during the time while I was integrating this first memory, this trauma in my grandmother's laundry and I guess processing the fact that my family was a cult, I started having a vision and I just wanted to distinguish the visions being separate from a memory and I find that those often come through before the memories. It's like your spirit or your soul just showing you a picture so as if you were seeing it through your third eye, a picture in your mind and it would often be there as I was waking up or as I was meditating and it would be a yellow window, so an old, old building, a small white building stone building and it would be the building would be white and I'd be constantly just shown one window of it an arched window with yellow bricks the, the bricks painted around this window in yellow and I just couldn't place it I was like I've never seen such a place a, a, a an old white building an old white stone building with a yellow window and that would just be floating around in my mind for months and that would come up as a memory later the next prominent memory that come through was of a drowning ritual. And you know, as a as a child, due to the traumas and the death experiences I'd endured where I was out of my body, completely lifeless, I had this incredible access to the spirit world. I would often be traveling around many places as I slept and really seeing the energetic world around us, which I don't think is too abnormal for, for children as a whole, but definitely more prominent in generational children where we have had those out-of-body experiences. And I'd always had this incredibly vivid memory uh, of me being out of my body, me flying from the back of my house on the outside and just flying along the side of my house towards the front of the house and I'd be underneath me I'd be watching my grandpa painting so this was a memory that I'd always recalled and I'd, every time I'd recalled it every time it had come up I would always be wondering there'd be a thought there of why was I out of my body why was I actually traveling like that not that it was unusual for me but why was I traveling like that during the daylight and seeing my grandpa painting my house underneath me it would be much more common for me to be having those kind of experiences from a dream state from when I was asleep and waking up in the morning and, and wondering where I'd visited last night. So the day that this memory come through, I actually remembered that out-of-body experience and I remembered the way I would fly along outside my house, along the driveway, down the side of the house and literally be flying over my grandpa the painting before I flew off into the sky. And it, it was absolutely, it was a beautiful, if, if you've ever experienced those kind of things, it's an incredibly liberating, beautiful place that you're in. It was filled with love. I felt like I go, could go anywhere. I remember flying onto the beach and flying along the coast and just feeling you know, just oneness with all the energy that was out there. And I remember as this memory of me flying along the side of my house in, in the air come through, I remember the usual thought which would always come up, which was, why was I out of my body during the day? Why was I out of my body flying over my grandfather painting? And the memory that opened up that day was actually of the drowning ritual, the drowning experience that actually preceded being out of my body. And it come through in several parts. I'd been abused in a small room at the back of my house. The fairly usual being strangled, being raped, being raped with objects. In this memory, my hands were bound up. They were bound up really, really tightly, which has happened to me in several memories, kind of like mummified. So just bound up really tight and it'd be cutting off all circulation. And this for me would result in, you know, the injuries of, you know, my fingers are constantly feeling arthritic. 
at school, I was barely able to hold a pen. And, you know, it's something that is very strategic. It makes us feel, you know, dumb because we're unable to write properly. I'm in pain when everyone else seems to be able to do such a simple thing like writing with a pencil or a pen. And it just made everything harder. And besides all this, it, it you know, is designed to remind us of this torture that's stuck in our subconscious that we don't quite have access to. And, you know, it creates this whole level of doubt in ourselves about not being able to do what other children can do. Everything was just hard in that sense as well. And I still can't even now, I can't write with a pen for probably more than half an hour. I struggled terribly in exams. It would just be like forcing myself through the pain because you've got to write so many words in such a short period of time and my fingers would just be completely cramping up. So this memory of the binding really brought back where that injury come from because I'd always, always wondered, like, why are my hands, like, so arthritic? Like, why can't I move my fingers? Why do they constantly go numb even when I'm sleeping? And, you know, in this memory, my hands were bound up. They would be hit, damaging my fingers. And then other times they would be put in boiling hot water while they were still bound up as well. So that would be part of the torture and part of what happened in the back room of, of my, my house that I was remembering. So after I was abused in this room, which was painted yellow, I was taken to the bathroom, which was also yellow, including a yellow bathtub. And I was held under the water by my grandmother and another family member and drowned. And as I remembered that and went through the shock of that and the memory of that, you know, there was the feeling of just being so sick of being drugged out of my mind. It was like my whole body was just melting away and going through the the, the drowning and just wondering how long, how long I can, can keep of between holding a breath and the choking feeling and the burning of my lungs. And then that was gone. It was just the excruciating pain of just not even being able to, to feel that in my body. And then I was out, out of that room flying along, flying along the wall over my grandfather painting just as I'd already always had that memory of being out of my body and it was like that memory come along to finally explain to me what I was doing out of my body and you know as as the other memories started to come through and link up with that memory of the drowning ritual I remembered that that day my mum had went to work and my grandparents had come down and visited. I was about nine years old. They'd been visiting because grandpa was painting the house, which was what I saw in my, in my travels. And I remember my mum getting home from work that day. And I was just so tired. I was so hungry. I was crying. I was begging for her to get me something to eat. As she, literally as she walked through the door and the other family members that were inside, so my my grandma and another family member had just left me alone and I was just unusually distressed as a child. Like it, it was very unusual for me to be just crying and carrying on like that. And, you know, I think mum was just a bit perplexed at like what was actually going on when, when I was behaving like that. But you just would never think that, you know, your own mother had been drowning your daughter in the bathtub. I remembered a few weeks after that how my grandparents had arrived for that trip to visit us and, and the painting and they'd come in carrying, grandma had come in carrying a slab of juice boxes, juice popper boxes and these were black currant ones, they were purple boxes and grandma would often offer these to me and she'd be really forceful about me finishing them and they would often taste completely off. And if I can commented that they tasted yucky and asked her whether they were okay or whether they'd perhaps expired, she would be really aggressive, which was pretty standard for her, and tell me very forcefully that they're not, potentially give me belching over the years for questioning her and that I needed to drink it all now. And you know, I've had other memories of these popper boxes being used around my grandmother, and some of them were in car trips so I remember my mum and me being in the back seat of a car and being driven to Peterborough apparently for a day trip and my grandmother was doing the same thing passing us both 
an orange juice popper this time, which just tasted absolutely foul. And I'd be complaining about it. And I'd just be told that I had to drink it all. And for this particular trip to Peterborough, I would have been seven or eight. And I cannot remember any of that trip, any of arriving in Peterborough. I can't remember anything that we did there for the whole day. I remember we left in mid-morning. And all I can remember, the only memory I have of being in Peterborough that day is standing in front of the general store for a little while before we actually got in the car to come home. It was late afternoon by that stage and my grandmother was commenting, you slept for so long, et cetera, and I just felt completely out of it. So I found it really triggering for many months just seeing children when I'd be out and about, you know, drinking out of popper boxes, you know, I'd have these just recollections of how I'd been drugged and I just have to stop myself. I'd literally be wanting to take these boxes off, off kids that I was walking by. It would just be so triggering. Um, but it was such a convenient way for them to drug me as a child is just pop it in a, a popper box. They knew what was popped in. They'd make me finish it. For survivors listening, I just wanted to, you know, share how paying attention to your dreams as you're healing is such an important way to make contact with what your subconscious is communicating with you, particularly with this type of abuse because of the amnesiac barriers and, you know, the excessive trauma that's been hidden away and, and sectored off in our minds, you know, our subconscious can often communicate with us easiest, you know, through dreams or the visions like I was having of the yellow window before the actual memory is able to break through as well in a way to kind of get us to consciously hold the possibility for it, to prepare us for it. And I can remember now, six months before I recalled this ritual drowning, I actually had a very, very vivid dream of me and my mum who was a complete slave to the family and suffered terribly standing just outside this bathroom in my old family home, the, the same bathroom where the drowning ritual occurred. And in this dream, the whole house was shaking like it was going to collapse. It felt like the whole house was possessed and it was just trying to fall, fall in on us, to paralyze us, to trap us in there. And me and my mum were both standing outside of the bathroom door, which was at the end of a very long corridor, which would go straight down to the front door and out of the house. And it was shaking that hard. And the feeling of just pure evil was so bad that I didn't even think that I could walk forward a step, let alone make it out of the house. And I said to mum in the dream, we have to get out of here. And mum just looked at me and said, we can do it. And we just held hands and we walked out of this long passageway. It was just giving me shivers. And it, it was it was like fighting everything to just walk out of the front of the house and then get to the outside of the house. And we both just smiled and looked at each other. And, you know, that dream to me was, you know, my spirit, my soul, my mind starting to take back the fragments of what had been locked away by that torture and, and abuse in, in that bathroom and starting to set that, that little part of me free so that memory could start to come through as well. I still hadn't placed the yellow window, but I knew that it must be important because it just continued to come up in visions as I was waking up in the morning. When I was meditating, it would just be floating around. And I remembered at this stage, another memory started to come through and it was this same building, the same shape. And I was being carried, taken out from a car that was parked at the front and a little bit to the right of this building and taken through, walked up to the building, carried by someone completely unable to walk and taken through a little side door on the on the side of the building towards the front. And it was it was getting dark. It was early evening. So the sun had almost set. And I couldn't tell you in this memory if the windows were yellow because there just wasn't enough light, but I saw the shape of the building was exactly what I'd been shown as the building that this yellow, yellow window was on. And I just sat there and thinking, wow, it's being carried. I, I felt incapacitated, drugged. I just had this memory of my grandmother drowning me in a bath. And I just thought, what's the chances that this is a church? in my grandmother's little town. I'd already recalled two prominent abuses, you know, one in my 
grandmother's laundry when I was four and then, you know, the abuse in my bathtub when I was about nine when my grandmother come to Adelaide then to do a painting job for my family. I was just like, what is the chances that this window is actually the church in her town? And I'd never, ever seen a church with yellow windows or so I thought. I jumped on Google, looked it up, Google Maps, and it was right there. It was exactly what I'd been constantly shown in my vision. It was the shape of the building that had just come through in the memory of me being carried out of a car and taken to the side door. And it literally was this little old white stone building, the smallest church you've ever seen with bright yellow windows. And that's all I had was the the, the memory of being carried up to the church. And I, I, I was quite persistent. I really wanted those memories to come through because I just wanted to know what had happened in that church because I felt very strongly that was a, there was a part of me being in prison there. And I'd, I'd done a healing with, with a, a lady that was helping me release some energy as I was going through my earlier memories because often as we go through memories, just everything becomes unbalanced. Physical symptoms come up. And she actually was seeing the yellow window as well, which I found quite interesting, but she saw bars on it as if I was trapped in there. And you know, after my experience of how the bathroom ritual come to me after I was able to you know, release myself spiritually or energetically from that room in a dream, I was thinking there must be part of me stuck in this church. So it was about a month later that this memory of the church actually started to come through and I was laying on my back doing a spinal twist, not thinking about anything, not thinking about anything at all except my breathing and just releasing my back and all of a sudden this memory just started coming through and it actually proceeded with the vision first. So I was shown the yellow window. This time I was shown myself as a child walking along the road on the way to school, which I used to walk past that church the whole time I lived in Port Broaden, my, my grandmother's town, which was when I was seven to eight years old. And that was when my parents had divorced. We lived there for a year. So I was being shown that I was walking to school. I was in my school uniform. So, you know, this vision was giving me a timing and then that went black and then it opened up and I was actually in a memory of being inside of the church, which I couldn't even remember what the inside of the church had looked like or whether I'd ever been in there. It was nighttime. It was dark. There was other children around me and we were sat in a little circle up near the front of near the altar near the front of the church behind us and to the sides of us kind of surrounding us were about 30 or 40 adults and they were all in dark robes some had masks I felt like I couldn't scream I couldn't move I just wanted to run out there's just this feeling of just not even being able to use my legs not even being able to breathe properly it, it was it was just like being complete and utter shock of like what is actually going on here. It was so foreign from anything that was in my life at that time to be in a church with people dressed up in in these dark robes and masks and it, it just felt absolutely horrific. Like the smell of a church just triggers me so much. It's like, like the smell of the dust, the smell of the old furniture. It's just a, a place I've never wanted to be in at any time of my life and just as I recalled this memory it reminded me where that aversion to churches had come from at the front of the church where the altar was they'd added a downward sloping ramp to the top of the altar and they took the children one by one they placed us upside down on this and I, I remember when it was my turn I would just feel all the blood rushing to my head just feel like my temples and my my brain was just about to explode probably because of the drugs that we'd been placed on I was wearing a simple white dress it was not one that I'd ever seen before it was almost like a hospital kind of tie-on really really simple and basic so while I was up on the altar being placed upside down with all the blood rushing to my head they opened the front of the dress so they opened some buttons at the front and with a hot knife they actually drew drew a line or burnt across the top of my left breast and 
And while they were doing this, there was various chanting, there was people speaking together. It was like they knew what was going on, but the children, we were just completely and utterly terrified. You just felt like you were literally about to jump out of your body because it was just so horrific what we were going through. While I was up on the altar after they bent my chest, they forced a metal object inside of me, inside of my vagina, and they were saying things that, saying things like I was being given to Satan's kingdom and there'd be further chanting. People would be repeating things after the priest. And a lot of it didn't even seem English. I don't know if that was the drugs and the shock that I was going through. I still find it incredibly triggering when people speak in unison together. And that's been something that I've carried through with me through my whole life and never known why, but now I know why. There was a feeling inside of me that they were going to kill me. You know, I'd just been burnt. I'd felt horrific pain inside of me, just the absolute terror and being completely unable to scream. Then once I was taken down from the ramp, from the altar, which seems like forever, the priest come around to the children holding a little girl and he was asking us if we will take her place. Will you die instead of her? And I couldn't even speak. I mean, you're you're in that much shock. You're in that much fear, fear, fear of dying at any stage. You know, it, it's is beyond what a child of seven or eight years old can even even fathom. And I just remember shaking my head. I I was so petrified of being put back up on that altar, being being burnt, being traumatized. And so again, this little girl was put put back up on the altar. And all of the adults moved forward and huddled around her. And all all I heard was just a shriek, just the most horrible sound, sound of terror coming out of her. And there's just there's just no words. It, it it was like my heart was pumping so hard. I thought I was going to have a heart attack and just the not knowing of what was going to happen next. Would I be up there? Would more of these children die? I literally thought I was in hell. I'd just been told that I'd been given to Satan. I I just thought I would be stuck in this nightmare forever. And at that stage, I blacked out. So I don't have a visual memory of what happened next at this stage. I know that after this memory come through of the ritual that happened in this little church in a town of a thousand people at night, I went through three weeks of just of vomiting of nausea of being you know strangled my whole body would be shaking the feeling was the feeling was beyond fear you know fear is when you are scared of something and you're wanting to get away from something it's like the fight flight response the the feelings that I had going through my body were you know beyond all this it's it it's beyond terror you know terror is when you realize that you can't get away and you're just stuck in this it's the only word that I can describe that even comes close is is torture it's it's like you are stuck in this and you are not even knowing whether you're going to make it through or at times even if you want to and I just I had to just hold my body as it just went through so much shock of what of what I'd seen of of a child being being murdered in front of me in just such a such a horrific way and for what for these just disgusting beliefs of of a cult you know and just to even fathom that there was like in this town of a thousand people 40 satanists to come along to a ritual and see these these girls being offered up to satan as part of their programming and and to kill a child you know, about a week into the the three weeks of just releasing all this trauma from my body, I realized that my my body was actually going through body memories of what took place, and I just had to hold my body, I had to keep telling myself that I'm safe, that we're not there anymore, that I'm an adult now, that we made it, and just just hold that little girl, that little little seven year old through the shock, the trauma that had never been able to be expressed and my body just my body just broke it it literally 
there were times that I lost my eyesight during those three weeks. I lost my voice. I constantly felt like I was being strangled. I I felt like my body was being beaten at times. I um during that time I actually had the mark, the mark over the left, my left breast over my heart appear on my body as well on that stay for about a week and and that was just traumatic and it it often happens with survivors as they're remembering these horrific traumas it can't as the trauma is coming out of the body the injuries come up to leave as well and just to see that it it wasn't a scratch it, it felt because it was so tender like a burn I had nothing I mean I, I couldn't even walk to, to get anywhere to burn myself at that time to see that come up on my body was just just beyond words and our bodies remember all the pain that we've been endured and all of these injuries and it was like I had to hold space for this little girl to release and process all of those feelings that she'd experienced and the only visual memory that I had was at the end of the three weeks of just complete suffering and allowing this trauma to leave my body and you know allowing my sight to go and my voice to go at times and just being completely unable to even stand up or or move I would just be laying there wrapped in wrapped in a blanket like I was it was the only thing that would make me feel comfortable was just to have that pressure around me and at the end of those three weeks, the the memory that I had that come through, which I believe was just the end of that process, was I was in a small dark room. I believe it was at the back of the church with my hands tied back behind me. I was sitting there and my body felt the same as it had felt for the last three weeks, just completely broken, completely unable to move bruised, battered, raped, strangled. And I remember just sitting there in that room, cold and broken and alone with the smell of dust and dampness and old church all around me. And I don't even think I could yell it out. I, I don't know whether I was still drugged or whether I was gagged. It, it, I, I just, I couldn't even speak, but you know, all that was coming out of me at that time was I am going to kill you all and you know for a seven or eight year old child to be thinking those kind of thoughts that to, to be expressing that kind of anger and I knew exactly who I was talking about it was all the people that had been in that church and after I'd seen what they'd done to that child and done to me the only thing that I had left in me after surviving that was to want to hurt and that's the most terrific thing about this abuse is you know the emotion the pain the trauma the anger the violence that is put into children during these events and you know, just to even to even remember myself sitting there at that time as a young child wanting to literally kill there's just no words for you know the suffering that these cults have caused and to know that this is still going on today and to even think that you know this this kind of abuse had happened in a church a church where people pray a church where people go to get close to god and after hours there's murders there's rapes there's just horrific torture of children it, it it's just it's so horrific the state of this fallen world at this time there was another program that i was put in while I was in school in Port Broughton that was linked to the abuse I was going through and was further programming and that was called LAP, the Learning Acquired Program. And this is still operational at this time. It's now linked with a lot of other programs, like some of those are called the Arrowsmith Program and these operate in schools all around Australia. Basically, they go under the cover for children who are struggling with their learning or struggling with their reading are put into additional programs that are run within the school but by external operators. So I was like the Asian kid, the only Asian kid in this country school of a couple of hundred kids. And by that stage, I was seven, seven to eight at this time. I was reading adult books. You know, I was writing. I was planning my own novel at that time because I wanted to be an author and I love to read. 
So, you know, this school was pretty backwards being a little country school as it was from the school that I'd been going to in Adelaide in the city. And we were actually made to to write there in pencil. So mum was called in by my teacher one day and she was shown an example of my writing. And because it was all done in pencil, it was kind of on the paper where there's like multiple lines and you had to like write within them, et cetera. It's like we were learning to write, which I was way past anyway. And this piece of paper that they showed up to show mum, it had my name on it. It had obviously been something that I'd started. And then I noticed that the letters in these sentences that had been written on this piece of paper had all been jumbled The words had been like swapped around. There were things, there were letters like written backwards. Like it looked completely dyslexic, like absolutely appalling. And the teacher was using this as an example, saying that I wasn't keeping up with the work in school and I was having problems with my reading and writing, et cetera. And I said to this teacher, I was like, that is not my writing. You can even see it's being rubbed out and rewritten. And I just... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. And she, she come back with, you know, you must have tried to fix it and you fixed it wrong. I just, I wouldn't back down and she wouldn't back down. And I was just like, this is not my writing. And I was just begging mom to, to understand that things had been changed. The teacher pushed along the lines that I wouldn't keep up, that I potentially might get kept back a year etc and I remember going home with mum and just begging her just showing her what I used to write I had books full of writing I had like shelves full of books that I was reading I love to read I love to write there was no way that I was writing letters back backwards like I wasn't even using that stupid paper at home to write on with like multiple lines mum was so worried from what the teacher had told her that she thought that I might get kept back, et cetera. And so basically I was forced into this program, which I really didn't want to be in to start with. So the LAP program that I experienced was basically a precursor of NLP or a version of it. So linguistic programming. This was in a time before there were real computers. So I would literally have to sit at a desk. There would be like a platform around me, a square. And the thing that I was reading would be put in the bottom of that and there would be lights, there would be sounds, um, there'd be flashing lights that would come up on each side that were kind of like eye level. The teacher would use a different trigger sound to let me know when it was time to read. I didn't have the word programming in my vocabulary at that stage, but it, it wasn't a huge jump to see that this program was changing the way that a child's mind works all under the all under the pretense that it's there to help them that they're struggling and it, I wasn't so the the sentences that we were given to read were really cryptic it was like Dr Seuss and there were actually sentences from the cat in the hat book etc so there were really rhythmical sentences many were repeated So sometimes things would have to be repeated three times, which is like a trigger. The cat in the hat book is interesting because, you know, the cat in the hat is a story about a magical cat coming into a house with children and basically trashing it and then destroying things and then somehow managing to clean it all up just before the parents get home. So everything stays a secret. And isn't that interesting programming to be giving to generational children? just teaching them that these things, these strange things that happen will all be cleaned up and then you go back to your normal life. You don't need to tell your parents about anything else that had happened. So in this program, I'd be given little sentences to read out. They'd be so basic. I mean, the words would be literally like the cat in the hat type thing. And it'd be have to be timed so there'd be like a sound before I had to start reading the sentence then the lights would go off um, and then it would be be marked whether I'd I'd done it correctly etc it was it was just awful and I remember actually saying in my own head you know that this is bullshit between each sentence just hoping that would somehow cancel out some of what I was being forced to go through at that time and I would remember after these sessions I would either feel completely spaced out or completely stimul- overstimulated, just like my mind would be rushing after them. And I was so angry that I had to do this stupid 
you know, extra learning program when there were other kids in my class that could barely read, barely write. Out of the whole school, which was a couple of hundred kids at max, there was only two children in the entire school. So me, the generational Asian kid, and then there was another very rebellious looking kid with long hair and just a bit of a delinquent as well, a couple of years up from me. So it wouldn't surprise me if we'd both been targeted because we were potentially programmable children. Um, Another really interesting thing that was constantly in that lap program was reading clocks, which we know is a real cult obsession with their programming. And what they did in in the lap program when I was in it, which was in the mid 80s, was they would get you to read a clock, but they would actually be adding additional accesses to it. So adding extra hands. So you might have a clock with like five hands on there or four hands on there instead of just the hour and the minute program. So it literally is by adding another access to an object, you're adding another dimension. So you're adding another way to process information over this one point in, in physical reality. And, you know, that to me is just making, you know, children that are already sensitive, generational children who've been opened up through trauma to the energetic world, you know, adding these extra accesses that have absolutely no benefit, no use out in the real world. They're just creating, you know, this sensitivity to triggers around us, to being able to see a layering, potentially to be able to be more responsive to this programming around us that's constantly put out through the media, through entertainment, through books, through everything we look at. You know, and to this day, I can't stand looking at a clock face because I had to just sit there for, you know, a couple of hours a week in this stupid programming, looking at clocks that had six, six hands. It was just nuts. So that clock program I've checked is still featured in the lap program today. And I would just put it out there. If you are a parent watching this, please be aware that they use third-party contractors in schools, you know, for these programs, these mind control programs. This is so nefarious and, you know, children, many generational children will be labelled with learning difficulties because of the abuse they were going through because they're unable to concentrate at school and they're so tired or they're recovering from drugging and abuse. That I was a really high-achieving student before I went to this school It's very interesting how it was easy for them to scout out programmable children in the schools. And we know that there are people scouting out these children in all types of institutions and, you know, groups and organisations where they have access to children and then trick the parents like they did me by rubbing out my own work and writing letters backwards. Like what sort of, a parent would never believe that a teacher would do that kind of thing. And I know my mum couldn't get her mind around it. So please you know, ask questions, do your research, check out these programs that you're being encouraged to put your children into and just check, you know, what, what they could be potentially being used for. And I know from speaking to survivors, their children have been targeted with really similar programs. Sometimes the same programs, there's a lot of different names for the very, very same techniques. Watch out for the clock thing they're constantly scouting and looking out for children that they can program and experiment on. And it's only by us being super aware as adults of this nefarious work that's being done, you know, in a school that we can protect our children. And, you know, I take my hat off to all the parents that are choosing to homeschool. I just think it's a, it's a massive thing for them to do, but you know how brilliant that children are actually being taken out of this mind control programming it's just indoctrinating children it's not educating them in any possible way and you know this experience that I had with the lap program is one of the more nefarious ways one of the more direct ways that you can see that children are actually being programmed in school so I wanted to talk a bit about the alien programming that was something that I always had access to in my conscious memory as a child growing up I remember the earliest experiences of alien programming happening when I was about five or six in the same family house that I was in during the drowning ritual. And the alien programming would continue right through my life. I remember that at the latest happening up to I was about 12 years old. So as a child, I would wake up in the morning and it was pretty normal for me and my mum to be talking about what we dreamt. 
I still had a lot of dreams as a child. Those all sort of went away as an adult. And I should say as well, it, um, it's very common for survivors to not have dreams. And it's a real sign that your unconscious mind and your conscious mind is just not, it doesn't have that same link and that heals as we heal we start having dreams again which is definitely what's happened to me so as a child I would wake up in the morning and I would often you know have had a incredibly vivid dream that I would want to tell my mum about at breakfast and often those dreams I would say they probably had a frequency of like you know sometimes once a week once a month as I was growing up would be around aliens visiting me so I would be telling my mum in the morning the aliens took me here the aliens was doing this and that and she would just be like, wow, you just have a fantastic imagination. And it was such a real and vivid experience. It wasn't like a usual dream as such. And I would be getting quite angry with my mom. I would just be like, mom, this happens. Like I was in this ship. They were working on me. I knew it was quite real because of the pain that I was feeling inflicted on me. Like quite often I would have metal implements stuck up my nose, which would hurt horrifically. I would have metal probes stuck into my lower abdomen. And, you know, these are all things that I'd be telling my mum. And but in particular, the pain, sometimes just as I would recall the actual pain that I'd witnessed during the dreams, it would just completely put me into shock during the day as well. And it would be such a vivid thing that I would need to tell mum about it. But she would be telling me that I just had a completely a completely vivid imagination, which, you know, would be a fairly normal response for a mum. The thing that caught me on to the whole alien programming or me being visited by aliens being set a setup was I would have around these alien programming sessions where I'd be taken to a ship and worked on on a table by several aliens. I would have these other recollections come through that were an actual memory. They were incredibly vivid. If, if anything, just as vivid as the alien programming or even more vivid. And they would be of me actually leaving my house. So my house being an old, was an old brick bungalow. It had at the front of the house, what's called like a sunroom. So it would have like this little room where you could put your ferns and your pot plants and stuff and hang out in winter because there was glass all around the room. And because of that, there would be two doors. So there was like a door to the main house, the sunroom, and then there was another door. So my memories of being taken out of the house would be as the front door of the house was opened, the door to the outside after coming through the sunroom, the cold air would hit me. So I'd be able to open my eyes just for a few seconds to realise that I was being carried out. I was over the shoulders of some some man it wasn't a man that I knew it was a man with incredibly short hair it would seem to be the same man that was collecting me and I would be taken out of the, the front door with sometimes I would actually have a recollection of him walking down the driveway towards the road sometimes it was like I'd have was just that cold air hitting, hitting my face and the the door shutting and knowing that I was leaving my home again. So because I was having these memories of me being taken out of my house at night by a man in dark clothing and with incredibly short hair, which was uncommon in the 80s or around in my circles anyway, everyone sort of had the, the longer rock style hair if they, were, if they were a male. I started to wonder, you know, what, where was I actually being taken at night? Where were these aliens? Was this person actually dropping me off at the aliens? What was going on? So when I would be in my alien programming sessions that would be on the ship, I would be perhaps very alert and asking more questions because I'd had this memory of being taken out of my house so many times by someone, by a man. And what I noticed in these so-called alien encounters was the aliens would stand you know around the table that they were doing stuff to me on would be incredible pain up my nose in my abdomen etc the aliens would rarely talk they would kind of just glare at me they were like you know your typical big heads um I guess people probably describe them as a gray etc uh big eyes you know bulging forehead and when I would look at them, I would feel them, 
you know, intuitively feel into them. And this is, you know, as a, as a child, you know, I was interacting with all sorts of energies around me, both good and bad, demonic, angels, the, the works. And I was really let down by these guys. I was really let down if these were aliens because they felt, they didn't feel any different to a human being. They didn't feel like they had you know, any energy different to a human being. They didn't feel like they were more advanced. And I would actually sit there while they were doing things to me. And I would say, I don't even think you guys are real aliens. Like, what is this? Like, and I would look around at the ship that I was on and it was, it didn't seem particularly sophisticated. So I cottoned on to the fact that, you know, these so-called alien beings that would do things to me in these these procedures that I would remember wouldn't be able to talk to me much. And when I would ask them questions about, you know, are you really aliens? I don't believe you are. They would generally just hurt me. They would be more aggressive. They would shove something further into my abdomen and hurt me. And, you know, I guess try and silence me through pain, but there just wasn't the interaction of dealing with any sort of intelligence that was any different from a human being. So I kind of unpacked that as a child that, what I was going through was actually some sort of program, something setting me up to believe that there were aliens when I was being carried out of my house at night by people with short hair and dark clothing, a man constantly. So it points to the fact that how much the military and various cult groups have used this alien programming in survivors to you know, give us something extra to have to work through to, you know, if we we come forward about you know, being taken or abducted by aliens, does the rest of our story about the horrific abuse we've been experiencing in other parts of our lives by family members, et cetera, get discredited as well? And I would say it definitely does. And this was, you know, this was from when I was five. So this is early 80s that we're talking about. Imagine how sophisticated these same programs, this same alien programming is at this time. And one thing I used to notice when I would be stuck in these places for hours with these beings, humans working on me, is around the edge. It was like if I tried to see right around the edge, my peripheral vision, it was like the actual ship scenario that was being put around me would have an edge it was like it was some sort of screen some sort of projection so that along with the fact that they didn't feel any different to a human being watching what's unfolding around us seeing how this whole alien narrative is is being used to you know funnel people into the new age movement and funnel people into thinking that you know there's aliens here attacking us and there's aliens here to save us at the same time the military has very cleverly been able to cover up their black operations by this alien programming, by being able to discredit survivors coming through, talking about alien abductions or talking about being abused or programmed by aliens. And we know that the military and you know various groups going right back through the Vatican and you know ancient churches, they were in contact with the fallen angels. They're in contact with demonics. They've been you know, downloading and channeling and bringing all this energy through from you know, entities that are not physical beings, entities that are you know, nefariously in the ethers attacking humanity. But, you know, this program is being sold, this mass programming is being sold that these are aliens doing this when you know, this isn't a new problem. It's not something that's happened over the last few decades. We can go back through history and see how you know, these demonics, these archons have been attacking humanity, attacking our minds for, for generations. And you know, I think it's really important that people realise how predominant alien programming is. I've spoken to hundreds of survivors who have been able to unpack and see through, you know, the programming that they experience and some of them are younger than me their alien programming was a lot more sophisticated than what I went through as a five-year-old child but by realizing that you know this is an agenda by the military to cover up what they are really doing you know, we start being able to take our power back and we've even been programmed by the military and entertainment as to what an alien looks like they're the ones that are controlling you know the mass 
the mass collective minds about these things. And once upon a time, you know, an alien would have been a physical being, a physical being that's coming in on a spacecraft, coming from somewhere else. And now aliens have really become these interdimensional, fourth dimensional, etheric beings that are floating around us that we can't see at most times. And isn't this just mind controlling people to give a new name to a very, very old phenomenon rather than being able to dig deep and actually find the solutions that are out there. And it, it's saddening to see how many people starting to wake up to ritual abuse and even survivors are being dragged into, you know, this whole preoccupation with aliens when the healing's not there. You know, how are you going to defend yourself from an alien attack? And let me tell you, once you know how to defend yourself from a spiritual attack, you won't be walking this, you won't be walking this world with any fear in your steps about anything. You know, this is a spiritual conflict that we are living through. And the new age and the military and many, many psyops are very, very keen to lead people away from the true solutions of you know, what we have, the tools that we have to fight back and reclaim control over ourselves and our minds. But we have to dig deep and we have to get past this whole alien programming. It's an amazing time of us being able to learn together collectively and share our experiences. And I think if we can do those things without judging, with understanding that, you know, people are, we're all trapped in different, you know, paradigms. We've been born into a world of lies and the enemy is the ultimate deceiver. But it's up to us to ask the right questions and really, really get down to the underlying truth of what's been going on in this programming because if we can't do that as survivors with our own stories how are we going to expect the world to understand you know the truth of what's happened to us as well and what's happened to them because everything that's been done to survivors with alien programming has been done to the masses through the entertainment and the media complex from everything from cartoons and movies for children it's just such a predominant psyop out there at this time so people always ask how survivors escaped, how they they found their way through the mind control and how they got away from the cults. And for me, I was incredibly, incredibly lucky and I'm incredibly grateful that when I was 12, I still had enough control of my own mind and I had enough access to my own intuition to really know that the family, my mom's family were pure evil, even if I couldn't remember the you know horrific ritual abuse and torture scenarios that I was living through there was enough known things in the day the regular day that I needed to to keep my myself and my mum safe from and it was everything from you know their extreme bouts of racism I was called every name under the sun for an Asian kid by my own family it'd be fits of abuse you know people attacking each other with coat hangers or pots and pans or whatever was was nearby it was this was a household that was extremely dysfunctional I had you know, the two parents and nine children in total and every single one was a schizophrenic at the extreme end of schizophrenia as well so they're all heavily medicated unstable there was constant drama a really really vicious words and you know verbal attacks as well as the physical abuse and just things that could break out into violence at any time. So it was a really unsafe environment to be growing up in. And I don't even know how those people managed to live their lives like that. It just goes to show that what people get used to, they get conditioned to. But all through my childhood, I hated hated being around there as much as I wanted to have a family. But there was just something in me that was like, this is so not right. This is unsafe. We need to get away. And when I begged my mum and said that I never wanted to see my grandparents, again, I'm eternally grateful that she was able to find the strength to put the boundaries around us. They continued to try to get to us. They caused a lot of trouble, but at least we were, you know, we, we were back in Adelaide. We were far away from where they lived. We had to disconnect from them all repeatedly as they tried to come back and harass us in our lives. It didn't mean that I got away from the programs completely I was just still being accessed through through school through being taken at night through various handlers coming into our lives but it was a big difference between living in the warfare of being within that family 
um, and actually having some freedom during our days. And I know that that decision that my mum was able to make to basically leave her whole family and cut cut us off, which is a really hard decision for anyone to make, has definitely saved saved me and saved us and allowed me, you know, the the opportunity to heal now because I don't think I would have been able to remain in control of my mind living in that kind of environment any longer than we did. Another thing that for me was a huge impact was I moved state when I was 29. I just knew that I had to get out of South Australia. There was something pulling me back constantly. I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe it was the rape that I'd went through when I was 12 or 13 years old. But it, at the same time, I think I always knew deep down in me that it was a lot worse than that. When I moved states, it allowed me to redefine myself, it allowed, allowed me to break away from you know, all these things what, that were unconsciously affecting me. And, you know, even though there was still a much deeper healing to come, which has come over the last you know, few years, moving states when I was 29 allowed me to move forward with my life. And I was able to have a career and have that success, travel the world, develop myself as a leader, have a horse, compete. And there were all things like when I was in South Australia, it just, it felt like I was in mud. It just felt like I was in a sinkhole and like no matter how hard I fought, it would just make me sink deeper. And I know it's a big decision to move, but I know for many survivors, you know, moving and starting afresh and getting away from the known traumas and the unknown traumas really gives us that space to heal. So I wanted to finish up talking a little bit about healing and the journey of healing over the, the first 12 months of remembering for me, which I have kind of covered in bits and pieces as we went through today. Each memory really is an opportunity to heal on a deeper level, just like each new truth, real truth, real grounded truth is a, another opportunity for us to heal on a deeper level as well. And I think it's important that, you know, once we know the tools that were used, the tortures that were used, the abuse that was used, we're able to actually reverse those. And I don't think, you know, any survivor will probably ever remember everything or, you know, would we want to? I don't know if many of our bodies and minds could, could handle that, but each memory that's come up for me and come forward it's come at the time that I've been able to process it at the time that I've been able to have the strength to hold space for it and it, it just reminds me of the three weeks that I spent having the body memory of what happened in the church you know I'm in my 40s now and I could barely handle that trauma without even seeing it just the, the actual feeling of it going through my body you know, how could a seven or eight year, year old child ever, ever hold that? And that that is a technique that they use is just to make things so painful and so unbearable in our bodies that our minds split and that opens up the ability for us to be programmed. So definitely look at, you know, what things in your life perhaps trigger you at your fears. These are all doorways they're all gateways to you know potentially what's underlying and things that you can like learn to understand unpack and then release which is the best part is you can actually go forward without them you know example for me would be my whole life I've never liked baths I've been yeah I would just freak out in them I wouldn't be able to stay in there for a few minutes even though you know I'd sometimes I'd really want a bath I'd run it I'd get in the bath and I'd be like, I don't want to be here. You know, and to understand now that I have the memory of the drowning experiences and the water spirits that were used in those, which I'll go, go into further in perhaps another share because there's so much there. You know, by understanding that this ritual that was done for me around the drowning, it was affecting my life now to understand that, you know, my response and everything that I felt when I've been getting into a bath my whole life was trying to tell me something because allowed me to release all that. And now I love baths. I love showers. I'm able to sit in a bath. I find it incredibly healing. I'm able to relax and it's 
it's like being able to rediscover parts of our lives that were taken away. Another thing that I've been able to reintroduce through processing all my memories was yellow into my life. I've always liked yellow, but I've liked it at a distance. So it was something that I could never have in my life. It would make me uncomfortable. I would love, you know, seeing someone in a yellow dress, et cetera. And I'd be like, wow, that's amazing. But it wasn't for me. And it's only through understanding the amount of trauma that has I've experienced and the use of the yellow color around me throughout my years of, of, of traumas that I've understood how that color was really removed from my life. And yellow is such a beautiful color. You know, there's, it's healthy, it's vibrant, you know, it's about expansion and, and, and beauty and, and sun. So, you know, it, it's such a shame that for so many years of my life, I had that taken away and I was able to just start re- introducing yellow into my life just through couple of pieces of clothing I had, I had a little yellow bag that goes inside of my other bag that I would use and it's just being able to become comfortable around things that have been taken away from us is a really good way to disable its effects but that being said we have to know the deeper layers of why we're uncomfortable about it in the first place one thing that I've noticed in all of the memories that I've come had come through over the last 12 months is so much abuse of children it takes place with us off the ground. It might be placed on altars, on chairs, on tables, you know, hanging from ropes or tied to things. And you know, all of these things take away our grounding and make the abuse so much worse. I mean, I know in the dream that I explained, like, you know, when I was under the most horrific trauma of being raped and abused as a four-year-old, the place of peace that I was finding was actually to go down through a tunnel into the earth to get grounded, to survive that, to keep some part of my mind together so I could get through that in this little world that I created inside. So, you know, grounding is an incredibly healing tool you know being grounded emotionally being grounded mentally making sure the things that we're learning are able to be grounded is such an important superpower at this moment and I remember as a child during the years that you know all these memories have started to to bleed through around and when I was a child of like five six seven and going through this horrific abuse one thing I've always been able to remember is I would go out into the garden I would dig a hole and I would run the hose in it and I would literally make a mud bath and I would put all of myself and all of my toys in there and just get dirty and on it was obviously just a way for me to clear all of or as much of, you know, this horrific energy that had been put on and into me out of my life. You know, time in nature, spending time with animals is incredible. You know, horses, my horses that have come along during my life have kept me alive. They knew the trauma that was inside of me before I did and you know, all of those things like finding that balance and you know, come, being able to bring our bodies back to this frequency of goodness and of organic life after this horrific trauma we've been putting through is so important. I've used plant medicines over the last 12 months as well. I've used iboga and aya and you know, I've found they're incredible to help open up the amnesiac barriers during days of doing those sometimes I'm able to go through 10 or 20 different memories and go through like a really rapid reintegration of healing them as well so I don't have the maybe week or month to process and go through those memories that it would take if I was doing them on a day-to-day basis it's something that you have to be ready for and you know you will literally face your biggest fears using these plants to move through them and I think people that know that they're ready for that kind of thing will know and they'll be drawn to those things as well but I found them incredibly helpful and incredibly healing and I don't think that I would have been able to move through as much as I have in 12 months without them. Facing your fears is just there's gold in that so for me my biggest fears were the water spiders being underground um, cuckoos and clocks so those fears have been things that I've 
been aware of my whole life and I would just avoid being underground if I went into something like a cave like on a holiday trip etc I would start becoming extremely anxious and hyperventilating or feeling dizzy just dissociating I guess You know, sometimes it is such a fine balance and sometimes I totally get it wrong. I've been predominant around all survivors as they start to break down their, their mind control programming. And because of my fear of Jesus and in a way my fear of God, it really meant that a lot of opportunities for me to heal I was unable to take because I, I wasn't willing to face why I hated churches why I didn't trust the Bible, why they didn't trust Jesus. But now through remembering the evil that I experienced in a church, I've been able to release that. And I've been able to look objectively at you know, historical evidence and unpack you know, what is the true word of God and you know, find, find a way forward of healing that is just incredible. It's instant. It's it literally is supernatural and you know healing through the church programming has allowed me to realize how much the cults attempt to take god away from us and you know to a big degree they they succeeded in my life for many years and by taking god away from me it made me very very vulnerable to being sucked into the new age agendas that have infiltrated everything from schools to therapies to corporate training and it wasn't until I had dreams and visions of Jesus coming into my life in 2019 while I was under fierce attack from my partner's cult family. The possibility of Jesus being here to help us really started opening up for me. And I've I've tested it. I've tested it in every way. I'm a researcher. Like I said, if I can't ground it, I'm not interested. But the things that I've experience being told by Jesus that I've been able to go off and research the things that I've learned through actually reading the word of God the Bible rather than reading countless new age agenda books is just phenomenal like the amount that I've healed in the last 12 months is hundreds of times more than it's taken me to heal anything in the over 40 years of my life and it's it hasn't been easy, but I would like to say it's had grace. So I've always known, I've always felt supported. I've always known that there was hope. I've felt very guided. The right information, the right people have just come to me at the right time during the healing process. And that was all part of surrendering to the truth of God. And I put it out there for any survivors that are struggling with that because that was me. For a very long part of my life, you just keep going, keep holding that space, and you know what is true will come, will come to you. If it's just so easy for us to get driven into you know, dangerous things and lots of lies and endless psyops that really just hold us back from our own healing journey. It's a beautiful thing too when the answers you're seeking start coming to you, you know, with that inner guidance, rather than I feel like years ago I was just out searching for information and it was leading me into so many psyops and it it was just leading me further and further away from the truth and essentially just wasting my own time that I could be using to find the truth within me. I just wanted to say to all survivors out there listening, wherever you are in your healing and your remembering journey, you are in the right place. You know, sometimes we feel so stuck before a huge breakthrough. And I always like to remind myself you know, that I'm only processing and remembering this now because I'm now strong enough to do it. And I've just seen this miraculous unfolding of the ordering of the memories and the way that things are coming through and the way that things is just unraveling and being unpacked and the layers are, are being peeled back. And it's absolutely incredible, the strength and just the the majesty of the human mind the body and the spirit and what's incredible is when we can trust in god and allow that to unfold as it should and allow that healing to come through it's it it has just been the most 
incredible experience within whether you're a survivor or not we are all survivors of satan's kingdom you know, we've all been living in this world of lies and we have so much deprogramming to do and it, it's beautiful that we can now learn from each other share our experiences and you know, move forward with more grace together and just to remember that life isn't something that's happening to us. It's actually unfolding and happening for us. It's something that I I always keep close to remember, you know, the, the beautiful healing that's possible within any, any situation and to keep grounded, to keep in truth, to love, to love ourselves and to hold that space and just to keep developing our inner worlds, keep developing our self-worth and, you know, keep developing your direct connection to God because that's where the true empowerment is, is when we can stand connected in the physical world and connected in the spirit as the true warriors that we were here to be to begin with, to keep learning, to keep questioning and to keep growing and evolving. You know, we're going to be unpacking and deprogramming for a very long time yet. So no one's there. And I think to have that compassion and understand when people, when you can see other people at different stages and know that you've been at those stages and you will be at those stages going forward as well as different paradigms break and fall apart for us to move forward. So I just wanted to thank, thank you all for supporting me, supporting our beautiful survivors that come on and share every week and our whistleblowers and I thank you just for opening up your hearts and your minds to to hear the truth from people direct I think that it's just so powerful to hear these stories coming from the people that have the lived experience and if you can share this information share these interviews you know share the truth that you've learned with the people in your circle of influence and that is how we change the world. You know, we don't need to wait for saviors. We're here. It starts with us. So thank you so much, guys. I'll chat again to you soon.